And then for the rest of y'all um, in the, on campus, this is our, our rock talks are really one of the few opportunities for all of us outside of mealtime, of course, for all of us to sort of get together and have an opportunity to listen to a lecture. Um, the rock talks have been going on here at the lab, I believe since the um, inception of the place. And um, they're wonderful opportunities for us to, to hear from and learn about um, current and emerging issues in marine science uh, kind of here within the Gulf of Maine. Oh, all right. That looks great to me. Um, and so the format of these rock talks are, are pretty straightforward. They're about 45 minutes of a presentation followed by uh, 15 minutes of a question and answer. Uh, a quick note about the Q&A. We've got a mic. Um, it projects from the speaker over here and it's also for our um, participants on Zoom. So before you blurt out your question, just give me a chance to get to you with the microphone so that our folks that are joining us remotely can also hear you clearly. Um, and then Gabi has a, uh, a lapel mic on her, so we don't have to run back with the mic. Um, so as an initial introduction, we're very fortunate tonight to have Dr. Gabriela Bratt with us. Um, Gabi got her, let's see, got her bachelor's from Mount Holyoke and then a master's from Bryn Mawr College uh, before completing a PhD in zoology at UNH. And she's currently a fisheries extension specialist for uh, the New Hampshire Sea Grant. For those of you that aren't familiar with New Hampshire Sea Grant, um, the Sea Grant system is actually a national scale uh, collection of organizations under NOAA uh, with a primary focus on sort of the conservation and management and use of coastal resources. Um, and so as, a, as an extension specialist, particularly in fisheries, uh, Gabi's work has focused for almost a dozen years now on uh, so helping to bridge connections between uh, emerging aquaculture opportunities and then existing fisheries as well, helping to build bridges between those um, resources and economic opportunities here in the greater seacoast of New Hampshire and Maine. So we're really fortunate to have Gabby with us. She has a, a wealth of experience in her career working with everything from seaweeds to lobsters. And tonight we're gonna learn about uh, a lot of work that she's been doing over the past couple of years with uh, the invasive green crab. So please join me in welcoming Gabi um, to our second rock talk of 2023. Woo! Thanks, Dave. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I was told that it was, you know, beautiful views and nice sunny weather, <laughs> but it's okay. I've been here before, so uh, I know what it all looks like. So. Um, yeah, like uh, David said, I have um, been doing sort of fisheries work um, in New Hampshire for the last 11 or so years, um, and it was pretty varied, but um, part of that job allows me to work really closely with our lobster and groundfish uh, industries here in New Hampshire. And um, right around 2015, I was uh, speaking to one of my lobster fishermen and he was getting kind of irritated because he kept finding these pesky green crabs in his traps. And he says, I can't do anything with them. I can't sell them. They eat all my bait and they take a lot of time just sort of taking them out of my traps. So um, he said, can you figure out something to do with them? I bet you they molt. <laughs> so maybe eat them or something. Um, so uh, that sort of got me going into this very strange <laughs> rabbit hole, if you will, about invasive species, which, um, you know, full disclosure, that is not what I went to school for. I studied, I studied baby swimming squids and stuff. So very, very different, but it's been really fun. So, um, all right. So um, I'm assuming, and maybe I shouldn't, but People have heard of uh, the invasive European green crab. Uh, it came over from Europe uh, about two, over 200 years ago um, in ballast water and it landed in Cape Cod, little larvae. And they have since been uh, very good at establishing populations uh, in the Northeast all the way from about Virginia, if you're lucky, but um, <laughs> all the way up to uh, Prince Edward Island in, uh, in Canada and then they had another successful invasion 
in, um, in the 1980s where um, all of our tasty Maine New England lobster was wrapped up in seaweed and transported along with little tiny green crabs in the seaweed over to the west coast. And that is primarily how they think um, that in second invasion began. And since then, uh, those, uh, that population has been traveling up the, the Pacific coast up into, um, into Canada as well. So why are they so interesting? <laughs> well, uh, here in, um, in New England, they have, like I said, been here for about 200 years. And in that time, they have had um, a really, really wonderful time creating some uh, very negative impacts on, on our local marine ecosystems. Um, they are really good at uh, reproducing and eating everything that they, they see. And so as a result of that, they um, have uh, contributed, to, contributed to the destruction of eelgrass habitats, um, which in our estuarine and coastal systems is really important for nurseries and things like that for fish and lobsters and other, um, other marine life. Um, and so they love to clip eelgrass and uh, kill those eelgrass beds, making it uh, less hospitable for uh, some of our, our other species. Um, they also love to eat everything you like to eat if you like to eat seafood in terms of bivalves. They love soft shell clams, mussels, oysters, uh, anything like that. And they really, really um, love to dig for them. So that's another issue that we call them ecosystem engineers because they like to um, really perturbate a lot of the substrates and cause instability in those ecosystems. Um, and so as a result of that, that causes a lot of economic impacts um, for those particular fisheries, especially in Maine, the soft shell clam industry has had a lot of problems and a lot of economic losses because of the green crabs. Um, just to give you an example, one relatively medium sized green crab can eat up to 40 soft shell clams or mussels or baby oysters um, alone by themselves. So multiply that by billions and uh, we have a little bit of a problem. So, um, another issue is as their populations are growing, um, that is also diminishing our biodiversity in a lot of our uh, estuarine environments. So lower biodiversity is not good for healthy ecosystems. Um, so they, it is pretty much evident that um, there is a link between the increasing green crab populations that we have been um, witnessing in the last several decades uh, with increasing ocean temperatures. And um, part of the decline in, um, in our very long, cold New England winters in the last few dec decades means that these crabs are able to feed and reproduce for longer periods of time during the year than they used to. So way, you know, about 20, 25 years ago, I don't know if you know, maybe some of you don't remember, but it was very, very, very cold. Winters lasted forever. It would start in October and wouldn't end till May. It would still snow and I would cry every year <laughs> because it was way, way too long. But it was really good at sort of keeping those populations tamped down. What's happening now is really we may be lucky and get maybe two months of really deep cold weather. And that's not enough to put those numbers, um, keep them at bay. And so, with them eating everything in sight and reproducing um, as uh, uh, pro uh, proficiently as they do, um, we can see how we are getting these populations to explode. As a result of that, we have, um, we have seen a lot of ecological and socioeconomic consequences, especially here in the Gulf of Maine, which as everybody now knows, is warming 99% faster than, anybody, than any of the other oceans in the world. Um, so what do we do? Well, part of what I have been working on for oh, a long time now, it seems, um, is, okay, well, if we have all of these millions and millions of not okay crabs, there are no markets for them, nobody wants to eat them, nobody wants to use them for anything, um, and they keep uh, sort of terrorizing our ecosystems, if you will, what do we do? Unlike what's happening in the West Coast, we did not catch this invasion in time. It was over 200 years ago. Nobody knew, nobody cared, and there weren't, you know, we weren't having uh, very 
different uh, climate uh, at the time. So, um, however, back in the 60s, there was, um, there was a scientist up in Brunswick, Maine, and he did predict that if we did not figure out a way to mitigate this population of invasive crabs, that um, we would have a problem as soon as, um, as temperatures begin to rise. So um, in the West Coast, they are trying to implement, um, you know, sort of uh, policies and strategies to help mitigate the spread of, of, this, um, of this invasive species, primarily by monitoring, observing, um, fast response type of, of work, um, and also starting to trap and keep track of how many green crabs are showing up every year as it moves up the coast. Um, and in the West Coast, at least, they are trying to put some money behind those efforts. The East Coast, we are not so lucky. And at this point, um, even if we did do something like that, we are sort of beyond, beyond the point of, of really um, having those strategies work for us. So as a scientist, it actually, or you know, as a scientist, it gives us a really fun opportunity to um, explore different and innovative solutions to this problem. We're not giving up. <laughs> um, and um, you have to look at it as, wow, this is an untapped resource, right? You have all of this biomass. What can you do with it? Um, in some states, in the Northeast, um, in Massachusetts in particular, the legislature has put in some, some funding for bounty programs. And those programs are for fishermen to get paid for targeting green crabs on purpose out of a lot of the salt marshes and estuaries. And they give them a set amount of money per pound um, so that it makes it incentivizes those fishers to remove these crabs. The issue is, okay, well then what do you do with them once you take them out? And so, um, the, you know, that is something that we are working on. How do you deal with that much biomass, um, especially if those markets aren't there yet? Um, and they're also, in terms of um, helping to mitigate losses for fisheries, especially um, the soft shell clam fishery, is they're trying to come up with really innovative ways to protect, um, to protect recruitment and settlement of, um, of larval clams and so they've come up with you know different nettings and cages and things like that um, that are uh, allow those clams to grow and so on without getting eaten and have it be deep enough deep enough that the crab can't, doesn't dig for it these green crabs can actually dig up to um, eight inches uh, to get to get one of those clams so um, they are very persistent um, and so one of the things that uh, we really have been looking at in New Hampshire Sea Grant and then some other partners in the region is looking at it, you know, I keep saying markets, markets. All right, well, let's look at some of these opportunities for market development and for commercialization of green crabs. Um, and this isn't necessarily a new thought. Um, again, back in the late 60s and 70s, people had this idea that this might be an exploitable resource, um, but then they tried it. <laughs> And it seemed a little too difficult for, um, for it to be successful. And so they kind of gave up on it. Um, but we do have examples of, of good look, lucrative fisheries. So for example, the blue crab industry in the Southern US, uh, it is a, you know, people eat them hard shells, there's markets for that, but there's also markets for soft shell blue crabs. Um, I think some of you have eaten them. <laughs> um, right hands if i could see um and it's it's a thing right like it's a cultural fun thing to do in um you know chesapeake and down south and um it is a very lucrative fishery um one blue crab can sell for six dollars um per crab um and that's not really how we do business <laughs> in in fisheries but you can have an idea that if you were able to sell a product like that for you know for six bucks or three bucks or whatever maybe it might actually be incentive enough for fishermen or anyone who wants to put the effort in to to uh to try and work it out um we also have another model and that is green crabs soft shell green crabs um in venice italy it is a hundred years old uh fishery 
they are native over there, right? So, um, so the ecological issue is not, is not an issue, um, but they have managed to create a very, very lucrative fishery and product that people go nuts over when it is in season, they can get up to 40 to 50 euros a pound. So with that information, um, some of my colleagues and I were like, all right, well, how do we do this? Um, and back to my lobster fisherman who asked me to basically fix it or come up with something or eat them. <laughs> um, that's sort of what got me started is, okay, well, how do we come up with um, a new seafood product? And part of that was really going back to basic research. I knew nothing about green crabs. Like I said, I'm a squid biologist. <laughs> I, um, so we knew really basically very little. We didn't know when they molted, how you could tell that they, could, that they were about to molt, when they molted, where, um, and so on. So we really had to start bare bones and it was essentially <laughs> trapping crabs, tagging them, and taking pictures every single, feeding them lots of muscles <laughs> and seeing, okay, well, if you get big enough, I have to molt. So taking pictures every day to see if we could see if there was any sort of change or morphological feature that could give us a clue. Um, and we also started thinking about, okay, well, what else can we do if we, you know, if we eventually figure out the soft shell component there's a lot more hard shell crabs than soft shell crabs because it's seasonal, right? So what do we do with those? So ideas um, that where other people are working on, um, they have more money, facility, the lab, <laughs> I have the field. And uh, so um, things were things like, all right, well, there's compost. So there's, you know, seaweed and lobster shell, oyster shell compost, which is very great for your garden. Maybe that's something we could do for it. Again start thinking with those numbers, what do we do with that biomass? So compost seems like a pretty, you know, pretty good way to go. Um, another thing is, um, I believe there's other universities in New York that are looking to extract, um, extract the chitin and other components from the shells of green crabs for bioplastics. Um, and so not necessarily green crabs, but other crabs. So that could potentially be another, another avenue um, to explore. And then, um, another component of the culinary um, expansion and markets would be, all right, well, maybe it would be a fun thing to drink. I'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> so um, the other great, the other opportunities that can come with trying to create markets for, for something that doesn't seem like it should be edible. Like one of the things that we work a lot um, is awareness and trying to change the narrative on things that get a bad rap just because. Um, so when people hear that it's an invasive crab, they don't necessarily think it's edible. There is nothing in their biology that says, don't eat me, right? <laughs> so, but just because we labeled it invasive, um, people get kind of sketched out about it. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the ways to start getting the word out is, oh no, you can eat them, it's okay. And, um, and, and not focusing on that uh, component of it, but also using that in a way where you can um, almost make people feel good about eating a green crab. So one of the things that we started saying to chefs and you know, people who are out there is like, eat a green crab, save the bay. Um, so putting a lot of that kind of narrative um, to the species is something that we've been working on. Um, and I keep mentioning soft shell crabs and the price that you can get for a soft shell blue crab. Um, green crabs are about half the size. So the other thought was, okay, if we can get a good, a good soft shell crab that is equivalent um, in terms of quality to a blue crab, flavor is a little bit different, but if it's you know pretty much the same, maybe we could also start getting decent prices for something like that which would also hopefully motivate fishers to take an interest in this new endeavor as an alternative source of income for them. Um, and then uh, the lobster industry or ground fishing industry here in New England is really hard to break into, right? So permits cost a lot of money, boats cost a lot of money. They're limited entry meaning that there's just a, a finite number of those permits. And if people aren't giving them up, you can't get into it. 
So maybe this is a new way to keep people on the water trying to make a living in a low cost way. So all you need really in New Hampshire to go fishing for green crabs is a $15 recreational license. <laughs> That's it. So, you know, you could start doing that and then, um, and then build up. Um, and at the same time, even if you don't eradicate this, um, this species, which is not the goal at this point, 200 years in, they've already, they have created an ecosystem. There are, you know, they can live with other species. They can outcompete them and eat everything else, but there, there's a balance there to an extent. So it probably would not be great to completely eradicate them. The goal is really to tamp down those, um, those populations. So as you do that, then you can let other things come back, get your biodiversity increased, um, save your eelgrass bud, et cetera, um, and also let other industries um, begin to grow. So in New Hampshire, for example, in Great Bay, we have a burgeoning um, oyster aquaculture industry. And um, they worry that their, their little baby oysters are targets for green crabs. If we reduce the population of green crabs, hopefully those, um, those uh, small, small oysters have a pretty decent chance of growing to market size. Um, so it just gives everything a chance to recover and come back. Um, up in, up in um, near, I wanna say um, in Quebec, uh, there has been a long-term removal program uh, at one of the national parks where they trap intensively for five, six, seven years, and they removed tons and tons and tons and tons of crabs. And they did notice that the populations and the biodiversity of those marshes that they were trapping out of were coming back. The problem with that is that it's not sustainable because it, you know it's capacity. How how long? Do you keep this going? Is it into perpetuity, or you know, does it is, does it eventually reach a point where it can, you know, you don't have to keep doing it? And they haven't, they have not found that. The other issue is that they've also tried to figure out, okay, now that we've removed all these crabs, what do we do with them? And I still haven't really gotten this uh, an answer about it. <laughs> I'm assuming they, you know, basically freeze them and then um, uh, bury them. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity and potential, but you also need to have people buy in, right? So, um, we have, uh, definitely seen that if you find the right, the right people who are willing to give it a try, um, these things could, could definitely provide new opportunities for people who are willing to embrace them. Um, and part of it is also trying to figure out a way to say, all right, we get that's an invasive species, but it is an exploitable resource. What, how do we, is it really a fishery that we're talking about? Because we don't want to regulate them. We don't want to, you know, to protect them. So what exactly are we doing? So some people keep calling it, you know, developing a green crab fishery. I keep calling it, maybe we call it a very lucrative removal program <laughs> um, because part of the other issues that we foresee is, okay, well, when regulation, you know, the regulatory end of things come into, comes into being, what, what will that look like? And that might be, um, you know, that might actually prove to be um, too, big, too big of a challenge. Um, so that's, you know, something to consider, but at the end of the day, we want to be able to create markets for, you know, new seafood. Humans really like their seafood. It is a great source of protein. Um, and these crabs, while they're annoying to pick, um, if you do have a soft shell product, you eat the whole thing. So perhaps, you know, maybe this will become a thing kind of like crawfish in, you know, in New Orleans, people eat them by the bucketfuls and, you know, you get very little. So uh, there is precedent for, for weird species to take off. And, um, and so as a way of doing that in 2015, we started looking, like I said, at the very basics of, of molting. We needed to know when they molted, where they molted. Um, and we, uh, 
in 2015, I had an intern. That was my that was my budget. I had an intern for the summer, and you know whatever at the time, two thousand dollars. So they're like, all right, we'll go have fun. So the project was, all right, everybody tells us there's tons of these invasive green crabs. Let's go get some. Well, we didn't know we didn't even know seasonality. So we put traps at these different marinas and estuaries, and we didn't trap any, <laughs> and we couldn't really figure it out. Like, well, where did they go? what's happening and this was you know sort of end of june and um and then we went elsewhere we consulted with um with larry harris who was our um marine biologist at unh and he's like oh you go to, they're everywhere you can go here so we did and we did trap um a lot of green crabs but then it turned out that they were all female we couldn't figure out where the males were so we're like there's a lot of other things to consider here so be that as it may, we kept that sort of in the back burner and we used those female crabs to try and figure out, okay, what are these molting signs, right? There's gotta be molting signs. Uh, blue crabs get a bright red line when they're about to, when, they, when they're in pre-molt phase on their, on their swimming legs. And so it's really easy for that industry to say, okay, keep these, keep these, keep these. They keep them and then they let nature take its course, they molt, they remove them, they take them to market. Pretty simple, it's intense, but you know, it, it's pretty straightforward. So we figured that's what it would be like with green crabs, and it was not. Um, and uh, it was um, not until we could figure out those molting signs that we actually started to get some success um, in producing soft shell crabs. So part of this required um, looking at how the Venetians were sorting their crabs. How could they tell that they were going to get tons and tons and tons of soft shell crabs um, during the season? What was it? And so they, um, my colleague, Marissa McMahon at Manomet went to Venice and she uh, said, okay, we wanna do this in New England. How do we do it? In Venice, they have um, a conspecific. This is not Carcinus manus, it's Carcinus estuary. estuary. And, um, and that is important because those morphological signs that we learned for that species were a lot more obvious. And, um, and so, but we had an idea. So we were looking in the wrong places. Um, they said, actually, you need to look um, on the, uh, ventral side, and you need to look at the episternites and sternites, and around them, if these crabs are going to be in quote unquote pre molt, you'll start seeing a halo. We're like, what is a halo? What are you talking about? Um, and essentially, if you look at these plates over here, and I don't know if you can see it too, too well, but where the arrows are pointing, there is a gray outline on the edges, followed by a white line on the edges. And those, um, those signs get more and more um, prevalent as they get closer and closer to molting. And what that is, is basically the old shell is starting to peel away from the new one that is forming. And so that is um, how you start to sort your catch because you don't wanna keep things that will never molt, right? So you wanna get as many of these pre-molts regardless of you know, what phase of pre-molt they're in. Um, and hold them and see what happens. Um, the interesting thing is we learned that. I went back to all the pictures that I took for a year and a half and I still couldn't see it. And that is you know, for another discussion, but let me just say it was, there's a seasonality to it and it's also sex dependent. So males undergo molt first and females later. And we, you know, we figured that out later, but... Um, what is interesting about this, these halos, right, is once you see them, you really see them. And you know, it takes a lot of practice and a lot of sorting and so on. But then right before they molt, they disappear. So you're like, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> well, it means that they're, you know, then you start looking at other things, like they start to split at their carapace seams and you know, so that they can back out. But the other really interesting thing that the Venetians didn't tell us is that the color or the opacity of the shell itself changes. So if you look at, um, you know, if you've seen molts of crabs, you know, along here, it just looks like a dead shell, right? 
Well, that's kind of the color that right before they molt, they turn. So they're shiny, shiny, shiny. And not all of a sudden, they're sort of this like milky, dug, uh, like dull um, sheen to it. And so that was another clue um, that we were getting close. And we eventually tried it. We looked at these things. We collected the, um, the crabs. We held them. And then we were like, oh, wait, we got them to molt. But now they're eating each other. This is a problem. They didn't tell us that they were you know, cannibalistic. So if we had done a little bit better research, we would have seen that the blue crab fishery actually keeps the molting crabs separate. So if one has just um, is about to molt, they put like a bucket over it so the other ones don't come eat it. Um, and it, the whole, it's different um, down south uh, how they do it with the blue crabs, but we did not have, um, you know, big tanks, et cetera. We had kind of small tanks with running um, seawater from Great Bay and we were at the mercy of that water quality, right? So we then had to figure out gear. All right, so how do we keep them to, from eating each other? Year one, we did literally Tupperware with holes in it and we kept crabs <laughs> in each one. So there was all this uh, Tupperware in these tanks, um, but it was a lot easier to keep track of those individual crabs so we could keep photographing them and so on and so forth. Um, but then we were uh, trying to figure out, well, if we're gonna turn this into an actual fishery, and get fishermen to do it. We can't say go get a whole bunch of Tupperware and float them. So we designed um, what we call crab condos. So they're essentially just trays that have individual um, uh, uh, cubicles, if you will, uh, for each crab. And you keep them separated enough and you have a good enough mesh that they can't eat each other through the mesh and so on. And you can stack three of them in a lobster crate and then you can, um, you can float them off of a dock. So um, we were also looking at, okay, well, can we induce them to molt? So let's you know, play around with temperature, let's play around with salinity. And we cannot induce them to molt. So we really do have to depend on, on nature and the right timing. And it took us a while to figure that out. And we also tried to figure, well, which, which of these different systems works better? Tupperware better, and maybe that will be, you know, how we, we do things and modify that, or is it these crab condos? And right now, it's the crab condos. Um, and so we ran some experiments from 2017 to 2019 in the summer, um, basically looking at all this stuff, uh, putting into practice those um, morphological signs, et cetera, um, trying to figure out, you know, how good are we at predicting molting with these morphological signs. And like I said, it takes a lot of, of practice and just looking at it, but once you see it and you get good at it, you won't unsee it. Um, and they're finicky. And the other really interesting thing is if anybody wants to delve into it a little bit more as a senior project perhaps, um, is that they can come in and out of molt, of pre-molt. So there are times when, like right now, we would have pre-molts waiting for them to molt and they looked like they were about to go and they never molted. Like they were, I mean, they even started to crack and then they didn't, they'd never molted. They were still alive. So they can control, if the conditions aren't okay, they can turn that signal off, which I thought was, you know, pretty annoying because I thought, well, you know, once, once you're in it, you're in it, right? Apparently with these, with these crabs, nope. I don't like the weather today. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna molt today. Um, and we're also, it's a numbers thing. So not every single crab or you know that you catch is gonna be in pre-molt. So about 10 to 15% of your haul is gonna be in pre-molt at, at one time during um, the molt season. And so again, it's these numbers. So in order to build markets and demand and supply, you have to have enough of them. And so a lot, you have to be able to have um, space to hold all of these crabs that are waiting to molt, et cetera. But we were getting pretty good at it. Um, some of us better than others. <laughs> and also we were in two very different estuaries. So um, that was really interesting as well. So once we sort of figured all of this out, then we wanted to see if we could bring it to the industry. And the industry, by that I mean, not only um, the fishing industry, but also the culinary industry. So we started um, 
taking our soft shell crabs, which by the way, uh, were, were harvested um, and produced under a scientific permit. So we couldn't sell them. <laughs> so we had to ask our restaurant partners whether or not, A, do you want them? B, will you put them on your menu? C, if people like them, how much would you pay us if you could pay us? And they're like, we'll take anything for free. And sure, we'll, we'll put it on your menu to see how it goes. And uh, wouldn't you know, they went like, crab cakes. <laughs> um, they would sell out, you know, they would get, uh, they would get samples from us for free and they could put them on their menus and as an appetizer and sell them for $19. Um, so there is, um, there is definitely interest. There's definitely um, people who want to eat them. And so again, um, we figured all that out. Now it's how do we scale up, right? How do we scale up production? How do we scale up interest? How do we, you know, if people keep asking for them, how do we supply that demand? Um, and we, you know, went through COVID like everyone else. So it kind of tamped down those efforts. But in 2021, it kind of came back. Um, 2021, 2022 came back like uh, gangbusters. And um, really one of our biggest success stories from this project, keep in mind, we've been doing this since 2015 is we finally convince somebody to drink the crab Kool-Aid, if you will, um, and give it a try, like in a commercial setting um, and so on. He started a business, he quit his day job, literally, and uh, started a business. Uh, he's going to be growing oysters, but also before that gets ramped up, he's, he's producing soft shell crabs in York, Maine. And um, I taught him everything. Uh, and he's modified it to make, make it work for him. And he, um, he piloted it. He's like, all right, if I'm going to really do this, I just want to have one year to try it out. Um, and in the York, in York, um, the York River estuary, he literally has 30 crates with all those condos. He did all of the sorting, so on and so forth, figured out um, you know, what was the best conditions for this type of work. And he was able to actually produce enough soft shell green crabs to provide seven restaurants for about three weeks consistently with soft shell crabs. So he's the only person I know in the US who has um, successfully produced more than, you know, a thousand soft shell crabs um, on purpose <laughs> and not for, not for, um, for research. And, you know, it paid enough the first time around for, you know, for gear and so on and so forth. And, um, and then the following year, he scaled up a little bit more. This year, it's really, really, really exciting. He has scaled up even further and um, is, was able to get um, tank space at a, um, at a shelf, um, oyster farm that has running seawater and so on and so forth. And he told me a few days ago that last week, at the end of last week, he produced five times more green soft shell green crabs than he had at that time last year. So, I mean, he's already in the thousands um, this year alone. Unfortunately, the season is, um, is pretty short. It's only about a month. It's intense, uh, constant vigilance, you know, to make sure they don't eat each other and that it's not too soft or too hard so that it is um, good market quality. Um, and he also informed me that restaurants are willing to pay anywhere from a dollar, you know, for small ones, all the way up to four fifty dollars um, for, for a good size soft shell crab. So we just need many more of him <laughs> to, to really get this going. So that's the soft shell crab saga. Um, if you guys go to Portsmouth, go to the Black Trumpet. Evan Mallet is serving Mike Macy's uh, soft shell green crabs and his restaurant, you should try them and then email me and say, those were really good or, mm, but don't say that. <laughs> um, so another interesting thing that has developed out of this um, was I was contacted by a very um, sort of niche distillery in Tamworth, New Hampshire. And it was fall of 21. And he called their head um, distiller called me and he's like, I have, a, you know, so you're C Grant, 
you can find stuff out like regulations and, and FDA stuff, right? He's like, I guess. Um, what do you need to know? And he says, well, I'm really interested in the work that you do. And I want to create something that um, can help spread the word about invasive species, especially the invasive green crab, um, and why it's important for us to, you know, to do something about it, whether it's eat them or, hey, I want to make a whiskey. <laughs> and I was like, okay, sure. And he's like, has anybody ever used green crabs as an ingredient. And I was like, yes, they have, but in a beer. And then people got nervous about allergens, so it didn't make it on tap. But we did make one at the Portsmouth Brewery and it was actually pretty good. But then they're like, mm, I don't know about that. So, um, so I reported this and then I went to the Sea Grant Network and I said, hey, food safety people, does anybody know? How would we figure this out? Um, and it, it turns out that nope, nobody's ever used green crabs in a whiskey but um, it, is, it is allowed. And the way that it is uh, done is it's double distilled. So you don't actually get chunks of crab or anything else. Um, you get the essence and flavor of the crab. You don't get anything else. So that was in the fall. And then last April, I get a phone call and asking all of these questions, can we do, you know, can you tell us more about the, you know, the background and the history and so on? And oh, by the way, we have a batch and we're releasing it for, um, we're launching it for Memorial Day weekend, 2022. And uh, you're going to have a lot of PR. And I'm like, uh-huh, that's gonna go really well because it's a crab whiskey. <laughs> uh, come on, it's, you know, it's gonna be gimmicky. Well, yes, it was gimmicky, but the thing went global. I am not kidding. <laughs> All of a sudden, uh, Memorial Day weekend comes, and then the next weekend we made it to Colbert. And he made fun of it, and he said, Oh, they did all this stuff, and then they made soup. <laughs> and, um, but all of this, um, all of these media outlets, um, newspapers, TV, and it wasn't just me, it was with the distillery, um, wanted information about it. And um, if anybody has tried it, um, it's different, right? But um, <laughs> it's different. You know, I'm, I drink wine. I don't usually drink whiskey, but I will say it was made with a very, very good bourbon base. And it's only when you swallow that you taste crab. And, and, and sometimes it's really strong. And sometimes people are like, I don't taste it at all. So, you know, I dare you who are of drinking age to at least uh, try it. Um, now, it's a creative way, right? And like I said, it really, it went viral. I was getting interviewed from, you know, online by um, people from Thailand and Italy. Um, I just did an interview with Al Jazeera a year later. People are still wanting to know about this sort of weird thing. Um, will it solve the problem of invasive green crabs? Absolutely not. It only takes about 4,000 crabs right, to make, to make a batch. And they're niche, so they make maybe, I think at this point they've made six, um, and they charge $65 a bottle. It's a super cute bottle, but 65 bucks a bottle. However, what it's done is it, um, my, the other component of it was, I know the harvesters. So I was able to connect um, a harvester with the, with the distillery, and there's some more business creation there. There's more partnerships that way. Um, and so that's one way to go. But because this, it was such a story, so many people have heard about the invasive green crabs and they are asking questions and they want to be part of citizen science projects. They want to know how they can help, you know, tamp those populations down. So if nothing else, um, people are, aware and they want to do things. And that is what we need. People to go to restaurants and say, I want green crabs. I want to go to a seafood market and say, where can I find green crabs? That's going to create a demand. Then the harvesters, fishers, you guys, anyone could then start, you know, meeting that supply and actually, you know, getting paid for it. So um, I like to point out those two successful stories while they may be small, 
they are having a big impact. Mike Macy, for example, has now hired, you know, there's job creation. He now has four people working for him um, and he is getting uh, his product into big deal restaurants. Um, that word is getting along. So people can see, okay, well, this is really truly an exploitable resource. Um, we can just be creative about it. The next thing is, you know, scaling up and we are, you know, and marketing it properly um, so that I said at the class, the invasives class earlier, maybe we can market it as the new kale um, or the new superfood or, you know, something like that. So um, there's a lot of challenges. It's been really fun because there's something different about it all the time. Um, but uh, I do think it gives, um, it gives us hope because it's a different way of looking at mitigation and, um, you know, and potential management of something that has gotten out of control on the East Coast. Um, and so, you know, humans are really, really good at eating down things. So develop a taste for green crabs and, you know, make a drink and then let's, you know, get those populations down a little bit. And I think that's all I got for you guys. And I'm open for questions. Whoa. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that was excellent. Thank you. So Thank you. Um, you know, I, I love the, the, the sort of connection between the, the science that you had to do in order to inform how to take it to market. And I think I was reminded of, I wasn't here on, I think it was last Sunday, but it sounds like there was a lot of conversation um, we had a career panel, mm -hmm. and I think there was some conversation around um, outside of traditional academia career pathways, and I think this is an awesome example of sort of how you can leverage strong science to do something very different than in the classroom. It was awesome. Thank you very much. And I can also attest that I actually have eaten last week former Schultz Marine Lab chef Cam Hines, who works at the Black Trumpet, served me two European green crab soft shell crabs, and they were delicious. So, did you have it with the whiskey? I, no, I did not have it with the whiskey, <laughs> but I had it on a wonderful bed of coleslaw. So it was great. Excellent. Um, so with that, questions. Yeah, let, give me a minute to run around. And I still get to do research, which is really fun. <laughs> I'm Hello. still a scientist. Okay, hi. Um, so I just have one question. Um, mm -hmm. It was sort of about the soft shell crabs portion. Um, if you like, as you're pushing incentives, are you like, you know, for people to to grow or like, I guess, have soft shell crabs, are you worried that like people might start to like raise them on their own, uh, like in their own controlled conditions? No. Like, okay. <laughs> I'm not worried because there's so many of them out there. Um, you would have to put in, unless you already have a facility, you're going to, you would have to get all that, you know, set up and started and so on and so forth. Um, I think we have so many that they're not, they're not going to farm them, if you will. I mean, in a way it's kind of, um, it's kind of like raising oysters, right? Um, you don't really, you know, you just get spat and you put them in a bag and you wait for nature to take its course. So there would be no reason for anybody to try and do it in a more controlled setting to raise more because there's already so many out there. So you just grab them and you put them in a lobster crate and you hold them that way. But that's very minimal you know, infrastructure that's needed. So I'm not worried yet, but maybe I'll eat my words. <laughs> Hi, I have two questions. Um, one, I was wondering if any, especially lobstermen, if they're pulling them up or using them as bait in their traps. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, wait. <laughs> um, so I have, um, the answer is no, but people are doing research on trying to use green crabs as an ingredient for alternative baits for the lobster fishery. Um, I've worked with a few people and a few lobstermen um, and the issue with it is that it just doesn't, it needs something else. So 
you know, essence of herring or something, um, because um, it, it, it just doesn't fish as well. So it doesn't mean that you can't use it as part of it. Um, but I have also had uh, fishermen who don't even want like, you know, like a patty or anything. Um, they actually take the crabs, mush them and put them in a bait bag. The problem is it doesn't last. And so if you go off and you have your trap soaking for more than 24 hours, it's gone really quickly. So, um, but yes, we've tried that as well. And people are still looking into it. And you had a second question? Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about your pseudo farmer uh, kind of farming the green crabs up in Maine. And I was wondering when you originally had them in pens in the river, was there any concern that you might be kind of promoting spawning conditions with so many crabs together and then even m minimally increasing the population or no? Um, no, not really, because um, well, right now it's so it's seasonal, right? And so there's no mating going on until both sexes actually have molted. And males, one of the part of, you know, part of our research um, actually informed us that there's, it's not um, synchronous. So the males that are of reproductive size will molt between um, the middle of May and the middle of June. So right now is molting season for males. All right. So the peak is basically now although it's delayed this year because it's cold. Um, and then, so once they're molted, they go back out and scavenge and eat and so on, and they wait for the females. And the females don't have their peak molt until mid-August to mid-September. So, and that's when mating um, really starts to take place because the female needs to be uh, soft uh, for that to happen. So I don't think any sort of, yeah, you know, well, maybe, but um, not significantly. Mm -hmm. So kind of, it's very similar to that question, um, but are you concerned at all with if this becomes a industrial scale, whether people will move from uh, potentially a more expensive option of harvesting the green crab from shores to creating kind of uh, like uh, onshore farms uh, to like farm these green crabs and potentially spreading them to places that they could have a larger impact than they already have? I think that, so that's a really good question. I, I'm not worried about it. Again, I feel like um, why try and quote unquote cage something in when you can just put your traps out to something that's already quite plentiful. Um, and remember, I said, I, I don't really love calling it a fishery because that implies regulations and policy and management in that, in that sense. Um, I think what would be a better term is, yes, a removal program um, so that you can keep fishing, make some money out of it, but it's not going to be protected. These are still invasive species. So, um, it's a really good question. I can't say that we won't have, you know, that won't ever happen. Um, but that would mean that a lot of people really like green crabs. So maybe, I don't know, I'm torn. But I, I, I don't think they would do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, I'm not from this area, so maybe this is already something that's happening. But in New Jersey, where I live, I live between New Jersey and Manhattan, we have the spotted lanternfly and everyone knows about it. I work at a zoo and I work with like young children. And there was a very long time where I knew about it as like a park naturalist and as an educator. But then all of a sudden, everyone, all the like the six year olds were like, oh, my God, it's a spotted lanternfly. I see it. We need to kill it. Like they knew about it. Um, and I know that with invasive species, there is like a very steep curve um, with the lag phase, as we've talked about in class. But there's a steep curve between when people on like the biological scene find out about it and then when the public finds out about it and they're at different times i was wondering where you think um the green crab is on this scale and like if that is something that people in um, the gulf of maine like have heard of and are aware of and are like actively doing like are there six-year-olds saying hey that's a green crab i see it i can identify it we should kill it yes not like in a murderous way but well, in a <laughs> let's stick the invasive species population. Well, I'll turn it back. Um, 
So that's a really, really good question. And had you asked me that in 2017, I would say, oh, I have my work cut out. Um, but we have made really good progress in sort of lay people knowing about green crabs. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of school programs. So kids are the best, right? Because they'll go home and they're like, mom, did you know about this crab and blah, 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 blah. And my own kids do that. And they actually did get in trouble at a camp because they're like, look at these stupid crabs. <laughs> and they were like, so we're like, no, don't do that. But tell people to remove them and then freeze them humanely and then put them in your compost. But um, since, since about 2018, at least in the Northeast, because there ha we've been doing so much outreach uh, work about it, we are getting not only just sort of um, you know, regular people to ask about it and so on and so forth. Um, but we are getting more and more phone calls from harvesters, either asking for, you know, where, where can I sell them? Or, you know, can I, I really want to participate in something like a bounty program and so on. So I think awareness is absolutely increasing. And I hate to say it, but the whiskey did its job. It really did. It, I'm not, I'm not kidding. It went global for months. I was doing interviews um, all last summer. I'm not kidding. I would do like three a day for one, for a month. And then I was still doing three to five a week until after Labor Day. So, and it wasn't just me, it was the distiller. It was the owner of the distillery, you know, and it was all over. So people are asking questions. And some of it is not pertinent to them, right? Like if you get it in Europe, it doesn't really matter because the European green crab belongs there. Um, but, it, they, but people are noticing and they are asking questions. Mm -hmm. So tell the kids. <laughs> Hi, I was wondering if um, at, at this point or at any point you were planning to like reach out to organizations to collaborate or if at this point you're just kind of looking for them to come to you because after hearing this talk I can think of a couple organizations I could picture working with green crabs and doing some really interesting things so I was curious how you're like planning to maybe spread the spread the, the joy. <laughs> experimenting in the food world so what we've done um, up until this point is you know we have to fund a lot of this work so I've applied for many grants with many partners. So we've worked with the Wells Reserve. We work with Manomet in Brunswick. Um, we've, uh, we've worked with Seco Science Center, you know, a whole bunch of different partners uh, to do that. The problem is that money only goes so far and then the projects end and so on. Um, and so th that's just our way of, of being able to do this work and, and fund it. That does not mean that I'm not interested in having other partnerships. Um, people have asked and they're like, oh, well, would we want to do pet food and things like that? But mostly they want to get hooked up with people who are targeting green crabs to get a supply. Um, but further development of that uh, culinary work, yeah, I'd, I'd be game. <laughs> so. We've got a, a question from a a Zoom attendee. I'm gonna, um, this is from Sasha Milsky. Uh, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Are, are these efforts to connect more farmers to this fishery as a, oh, sorry, are there efforts to connect more farmers to this fishery as a source for composting? You touched on this a little bit. Yes. So um, I'm not doing composting. Um, I, we have spoken with other partners. Um, to see if that could be something. Um, I know Quahog Bay uh, um, Conser Conservancy up in Maine is, was doing some testing on that um, with, with farms. Um, I wouldn't mind, but I don't know. I don't work with farmers really. The issue at hand would be the number of crabs, right? <laughs> And they're very, very stinky. And so, you know, if you're a farmer, maybe you have a fallow field, you're like, yeah, go to town. Um, I don't think that would, I think it would be great to form those relationships. I myself am not making that um, effort. It's not a bad idea though. Uh, one more question from the crowd. Great. Hello, 
Hello. Um, so you mentioned cannibalism, and I was wondering if you could elaborate more to any patterns you see, either with like regard to the molting timing or like if it's primarily males or females, or you see anything like that. And also if you have any advice to someone who just picked up 30 green crabs. <laughs> advice for what? <laughs> um, we just picked some up. Um, we're doing a study on them. Oh, okay. But to prevent uh, cannibalism, sorry. Oh, to fight. Okay. Yeah. I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> advice about them, how to handle them. Um, <laughs> So really good question. Um, really, they only eat each other uh, when one of them had molted, right? So they were super soft. They have no defense at all. What's really funny about them is that even though they're mushy and soft and leathery, they're still mean. And they get really mad and they'll come to you like, I'm going to get you. I'm like, you're soft. You can't do anything. <laughs> um, but they, so when we when we noticed that they were eating each other, um, we, that's where we figured out um, for our crab condos that the mesh size needed to be different because they literally would go between the, um, the mesh and pick each other apart. So if you had a non-molted one with a molted one, that was bad news. So um, that's why we had to make those adjustments. And it happens whether it's male or female. Um, so when they sort of spontaneously molt in those crates, we found a lot of cannibalism that way. Um, but usually keep in mind, we're, har we're trying to target either one sex or the other. So that question of, you know, do the males do it, you know, eat, eat them more, um, it's hard to answer, but they'll eat anything. And if you don't feed them for a month, they'll eat anything and anyone. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, if you're trying to do molting, you just, you have to keep them separate. Um, because, and, and, you know, you can, they won't, and they don't all molt synchronously either. Um, so you just have to make sure that either they're all around the same pre-molt phase or make sure that there's a good barrier in between. They also, we would stack them and then once from the bottom would eat the ones from the top. So like you have to, you, we have to put little, um, little feet on each of the condos so that they couldn't get up there. So, um. But in the blue crabs, they just put a bucket <laughs> over each one. So until they're ready to be harvested. Was that the advice you were looking for? <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Please join me in, in thanking Gabby for, for being here with us tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Good.